I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. You do. You do. I kept your uh, clap out sounds. Yeah, I know. A couple I times. Heard them. I boosted I heard the them. volume, in fact. I know. I've heard them. <laughs> And I deliberately was trying to hide the ouch on the last one. <laughs> <laughs> but I caught it. Um, so I think if people have been paying attention to your Instagram, uh, congratulations, yeah. Brandon. I had, I have, uh, I have a, I made a baby. A baby is coming. I made a baby. A baby. A baby. A baby. Yeah. A baby. No, it's good. I started working on the progeny pit already, so that's good. So oh. I don't have to work on it in the summer when it's going to be um, warm. The progeny pit is that going to be the room that had the cat litter box in it, or is it going to be? I'm going to assume it's that one, right? Yeah, it's that one. It's that one. That's okay. why we're calling it the nursery because it sounds more metal than nursery. It's the the progeny pit. It also has it also has um, alliteration, which is always good. Yep, I love some good alliteration. Um, not going to lie, alliteration was part of the reason why I messaged my current girlfriend for the first time. Um, <laughs> so I'm always a fan of alliteration. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, congratulations. Yeah. Why, well, thank you. Um, I was telling you before, I haven't had a reasonably cooked steak in months. And then yeah, you said, no. why not just buy two steaks? And then I was like, go away, John. <laughs> Well, Nobody and, asked and, you. And, well, Brandon, and then you told me what your what your wife said, which is, why don't you just cut the steak when uh, it's at the, the 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 temperature you like, and you just say no. Yeah, I'm just like, no. Why? That's too much work. Cut it in half when it's how I like it, and leave yeah. your half on for a little bit longer. Huh. But like that's that's huh. so easy. That's like, Brandon. That's that's bare minimum like that's pretty i pretty much do that when i work on a steak anyways because i'll do a cut into the steak to verify that it has the correct redness and then like all you just have to do is cut it a little bit longer like a little bit a little bit yeah so let's say like maybe how i like it you cut that part off and by the time it's done resting hers is done or i could just be leave it all on That's how I, I that's I, how I roll. I can't really argue with your laziness though, because like I definitely would do the same thing. Yeah. I would just accept fate. But I mean it's but at the same time, you're also not like saving yourself any work because you ultimately need to cut it in half anyways at the end. Yeah. Oh, so if you want like, to talk about accepting fate, I just purchased a second pair of big pants. Brandon. A second pair. It's it's, it's all downhill from here. It's you know all that. downhill. Yeah. It, it's 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 it just keeps going from here now. Oh, I hope not. You've set you've set the wheels in motion. Once you've once you've accepted the big pant the, the, the bigger pants, that's that's the moment. Yeah, I accepted the bigger pants. I had my um my my routine uh physical uh two days ago. And uh, my doctor was like, oh, do you have any questions? I brought up some different things that I noticed about me that I never brought up before. And um, pretty much got told, like, yeah, that's that's just your life now. You're, you're, uh, it's called aging. <laughs> I refuse. I have not gone to the doctor in, like, four years now at this point. <laughs> oh, um, that means you don't have a doctor, by the way. I know. I know. Okay. I know that means I don't have a doctor. Uh and part of that is because the last time I went to a doctor, they literally, like, just shoved me off when I was in crisis mode. So, um, I don't want a doctor right now. I'm a little mad at doctors. Get, just get a different doctor. There's, they're, they're, That's you true. You can shop around. Also, like, I don't feel like spending money on doctors, and I don't really have good insurance right now. I have... Fair. I have, I have PhD student insurance, 
which is like just a hair above no insurance. Yeah, well, the rule is like you go to the doctor and just know every time you go, it's 30 bucks. But then anytime they suggest you do anything, decline because that's going to cost you a lot more. Yeah, that's true. That's basically what I did this time. They're like, yeah, so like you already had all the stuff done and all your blood work looks fine for like what we normally look for. So you can, if you want, you can opt, you can do this. We can say that for, for this thing. It's like, no, <laughs> no. So, so what happened to me, I don't know if I've ever told this story. Um, I woke up with a strange pain that required me to go to a urologist. Always fun. Okay. Um, because like, well, what a- ended up happening was I went to my primary care doctor Wait, no, no, I skipped my primary care doctor. I went straight to the urologist because I didn't feel like going through them um, because I was just going to go there anyways, and it would basically be me driving into New Paltz and driving to Poughkeepsie. And that's uh, just, I don't feel like doing too much. that. I don't feel like doing that back and forth, so I just went into, I, I was just like, I'm just going to go to the urologist. Yeah. Um, Because I already had them as an established urologist, yada, yada, yada. Um, So I go there. They do the routine check, and then they're like, well, let's do um, let's do a scan. I think they have, like, an MRI. No, they don't have an MRI machine. They have, like, a CAT scan machine or something. Yeah. Um, and they did it, and it was nothing, ultimately. There was no, no problems, but, like, you kind of have to get that checked out, because if you don't, bad stuff can happen. This yeah. is this is This is a public service announcement to anyone who has the particular configuration of genitals that I have. <laughs> um, get your bits looked at. If you feel pain in your bits, get them checked out. It's usually a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, because unlike certain other bits of your body, when those bits have pain, that's usually a problematic thing. There's an episode of the Venture Brothers about it. Just take a watch <laughs> of it. Um I don't remember the name of the episode precisely, but it's an episode. Um, so I end up getting the bill, and it was for like a grand. Sounds about right. Because uh, my my insurance declined to pay for the procedure, and I got a message for them as they were starting the procedure, and I couldn't stop it. That's always fun. That's- yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, this shit, we got a six hundred dollar bill from because she had a Erica had to walk around a traffic cone in the hospital hallway, and uh, with insurance that shit's six hundred dollars to be observed walking around a cone, and then it's another hundred dollars to have somebody review the paperwork of the person that was watching her walk around the cone. So that's seven hundred dollars. <laughs> Medical medical billing is criminal in America. Is yeah, long it's crazy. Day. Like they, they, it was like an it, it was a to walk. It was an eight minute walk around traffic cones in a hallway. <laughs> that shit was God. so much money. I I hope you're ready for uh, for the the crimes against your wallet that are going to happen soon. Oh, the most expensive thing I ever saw uh, uh, saw was um, looking at uh, baby stuff. The hospital in which we're going to go to offers private they, they literally offer private suites and nothing okay. sounds more expensive to me than a ho- a hospital using hotel language i didn't look at yeah. the price but she mentioned private suites and i was just like nope i was like don't even get comfortable we're not like <laughs> we're not you're getting the fuck out of there yeah <laughs> we're bringing our own ibuprofen and tylenol yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're, there's a bench outside. We're going to have the doctor come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have like private suites and all this different spa shit. And I was like, no. Jesus Christ. No. A hospital oh, should not have my spas. God. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> and she agreed, by the way. We, we've been doing dealing with this shit forever. So. <laughs> Here, ha- this is this is your stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bite. Yeah. No, not I'm not I'm not that bad. I'm I'm no, anti private hospital suite. <laughs> I, no, I know. I'm I'm with accommodations is, is... for two people, by the way. Really? 
Yeah, so that huh. like I could also spend nights there. That's I was like, interesting. I don't intend to spend nights there. Like I'm gonna be yeah. there until until we can leave. Yeah, that's fair. That's 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 totally reasonable. Um, but I will accept. Like I've, I've, I went to college. I passed out on plenty of floors. I, uh, uh I'll curl up on a floor, <laughs> no yeah, problem. I, I have a real serious problem in which I don't, um, I don't like going to hospitals. I don't either. Uh, they make me feel really uncomfortable and like constantly like fearful um i part of it is because when i was a kid i was in hospitals a lot for various surgeries and like i have bad memory associations with that but like yeah i'm not a huge fan of hospitals as a rule um the smell's bad and it just it reminds me that i have mortality and i don't want that (laughs) i spent most of my life trying to avoid thinking of the thought that life is finite yeah, no. I mean, it makes life worth it, but at the same time, like, you don't want to think about it. Nope. Um, and on that wonderful note, Brandon. Yes. I think it's time to start this week's episode. Oh man. Um, so there's that whole thing that Brandon reads on his episodes. Listen to an odd number episode to hear it. Uh I'm John. I'm Brandon. And, and Brandon this week. Yes. This week, I have a truly wonderful episode for you. Um, I'm going to just get out in front of it right now and tell you, it is part one of a a two-part episode. Yes. Because I hit ten pages, and I didn't even get out of the first three sightings. Oh, Lord. Um, So it was first recorded... And described by a European in 1909. Okay. Its taxonomy is sauropod, and its region is Congo River Basin. Brandon. Sauropod. I'm Googling sauropod. Okay, okay. What is this cryptid? Um, Okay, le membre, I think. Dino. correct. The Congo dino. You are correct, Brandon. That was in some of my uh, favorite books from the Scholastic Book Fair when you open the things and they got all the things in there. Yeah, it's one of my least favorite cryptids. I'm excited. Um, and not because of what it is, but because of the story surrounding it. Um, and you know what the worst part is, Brandon? Yeah. I don't even get to those stories yet in this episode. <laughs> I'm pre-1950s in this episode. Brandon, there is a whole half century and more of shit that I haven't covered about this cryptid and young earth creationists. <laughs> I so knew that's like, where it had to go. So, like, Brandon, this episode, this this two-parter is going to be fucking wild. It makes the Ropin look respectful oh. of culture. It makes nice. it makes that whole thing look like even remotely okay is how bad this one is. Okay? Sounds juicy. Cuz like Brandon this is Central Africa and it starts in 1900. I edited one of the quotes because I didn't feel like saying the N word. <laughs> so get ready. Because it's time. And I haven't talked about a dinosaur cryptid in well over a year because we all know what happened the last time I talked about one. Um, and Yeah, that was Clay, episode 16 called John Yells for an Hour. What, really? It was that long It was ago? episode 16. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I kind of avoided dinosaur cryptids deliberately because um, I like dinosaurs. I like dinosaurs a lot. I have all the Dinobots multiple times. I've got more Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Megazords than I can count. I literally have a T-Rex sitting on my on my desk right here next to me that I used for a D and D campaign. I made a D and D like sub module <laughs> about Jurassic Park. Brandon, I love dinosaurs. So, so tell me why you love. 
<laughs> Mokili Membe. I hate Mokili Membe. Your favorite cryptid. Mokole Membe. Um, so this is one of the things that I knew I was eventually going to have to cover for this podcast. This is up there with Nessie. This is up there with the Jersey Devil. Um, and, you know, all the, like, big dudes. And, like, I still need, we still need to do the, the introduction to Bigfoot. Like, the initial Bigfoot. We've covered Bigfoot on this podcast, but we've never covered, like, Bigfoot's origin story. Yeah, it's, uh, he was left in a, a, a thing in front of a firehouse. I'm gonna just say that that's entirely incorrect, but I'm gonna move on from it. Okay. So, Mokile Membe, and if I get that that pronunciation wrong, sorry, I'm not even sure if that's a real word is the problem, okay? Like, I don't know if this is a total fabrication, the name itself. That's how fucked up this story is, <laughs> Okay? I would say so it's entirely it's, possible. It's wholly made up. Yes, yes. So it's a water-dwelling sauropod whose name apparently means one who stops the flow of rivers. Now, Brandon. Yes. I'm not sure if that's correct. <laughs> At all. That's just what people say the name is. The say the name means. It's in yeah. the Lingala language, and that's the language of the uh, the Bantu people who reside in the Congo River Basin alongside of um, the people of the forest, which is the name I'm going to use instead of pygmies, because I feel like that's a very, like, not okay term to use. Yeah. Personally. Um, Because it's also, like, super derisive because they're short. And, like, no. Fuck that. I'm going to call them the people of the forest, which, surprisingly, I don't think that they make that many appearances in the story. Um, even though they're the population that was most endemic, like, from that region. <sighs> <laughs> I just see you preparing yourself. <laughs> so, like I said, not sure if this, like, like every part of this story is in huge, <laughs> like, scare quotes. Because, like... I found books that say that these things were said. I found articles that say these things were said. It's a part of the lore around Mokile Membe. Mokole Membe, whatever. Um, but I don't know how much of this is remotely true. <laughs> and when I say true, I don't mean that the cryptid exists. Because I don't think the cryptid fucking exists. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Okay? Because I... But can you prove I, it doesn't? No. But I don't think it does. Now, I don't know if any of these fucking stories are true in any way, shape, or form. There's only one that I really dug into, and that's like the last, like... 30 minutes of this episode, Brandon. <laughs> so, before I get into this descent into madness, let's talk about the Congo River Basin. I like the Congo River Basin. It's pretty cool. Um, it's a lot ecologically really, like, dope. Uh, it's located in Central Africa. It's about 3.7 million square kilometers, or 1.4 million square miles, which is, like, near five times the size of Texas and three times the size of Alaska, I believe. Um, now that I'm saying that out loud, I need to verify those numbers because, um, I think I might have accidentally compared kilometers against square miles, but still, regardless, it's bigger than Alaska or Texas. Texas. Um, the region, as I said, is absolutely massive and it reminds me how terrible the Mercator pro projection is and how like yeah. racist, uh, like how like. It's incredibly racist when you think about it. Like, it it wasn't trying... I don't think it was trying to be racist, but it makes Africa and South America look like they're nothing. Yeah, it, it wasn't trying to do anything, but it, it, like, wildly changed 
the perceived size of land yeah, masses. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really affected how valuable we view particular portions of land, and it's super problematic. People just use globes. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Just use fucking globes. I don't care about maps. Get them. Get that shit out of here. Just use a globe. It's a globe. What do you have against um, cartography? I have a problem against the Mercator projection. It's a bad projection. Um, I like the ones that have like the 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 like circles because it's like effectively a globe, just like the printout of the oh, globe, the ch -ch 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 like laid the out. Little, yeah, the little like McDonald's one. cuts. Because it's it's less of a um, it, it's less it's not a projection. It's like literally closer to it but that's yeah so what's your opinion map talk. about maps missing new zealand you made a very confused face so there's Wait, a shit is ton that of a thing there's a shit ton of maps that just don't include new zealand at all <laughs> just, just google that google google already auto there's a reddit for it maps without <laughs> new zealand Wow, that's a that's a whole fucking thing. Yeah, we're we're very bad at map. Yeah, well, I could have told you that. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is this map? What is this map? Who who in their fucking right mind drew this map? Bunting's map of the world, circa fifteen eighty. Brandon, Brandon. Brandon, this map is the worst map I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's a, a good one. Map. That's a bad map. Um. Wow, that's really bizarre. Huh. <laughs> New Zealand is in Africa, right? <laughs> okay. Um. That's so far beyond what we're we're talking about. But God, I hate that. That's a thing. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, maps, uh, so, um, you might know this, and I might have brought this, brought this up on the podcast before, but maps are really closely tied to my PhD. To, like, a disgusting degree. Um, like, maps are very important, um, because they help us negotiate space and understand what's going on around us. Um, I, I personally am studying things as they relate to location-based games and, um, locative apps, which is a slightly different thing, yeah. but, like, they're kind of modern maps, like, like, you know, paper maps. It's just yeah. different. It's a different But thing. those apps, those applications are not available if you live in New Zealand, oddly enough. <sighs> I was in the middle of, I was in the middle of trying to explain something acade actually academically valuable for this podcast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um... But I'm going to stop now. Okay. <laughs> um, because I'm already I'm already at my limit. Like, researching this topic has already put me to my insanity limit. Um, and after this, I'm probably going to have to just take a nice long drive with the windows slightly cracked just to kind of, you know, cool off this just manic energy that this is giving me. It is um, nice outside. It is nice. It is nice. I might even ride my bike. I'm not sure. We'll find out. So, um, matching its huge size, the region contains either partially or wholly 10 countries. Angolan. Angolan. Angola. 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 Gabon, Burundi, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Dominican, the, the Dominican, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Zambia. So, oh wait, that's nine. Did I miss one? <laughs> Counting live. I, I I missed I missed one mm. on that list. So there's another one that I must have not written down. So it's either nine or ten, which now I'm going to look to <laughs> <laughs> because I can't believe I missed one. Uh, well, I can. Because I'm bad at writing down maps, things. Can't believe in uh, many things. Four, Let's see. Five, six. Oh, Republic of the Congo. I left the Republic of the Congo off. Oh. Uh, which is distinct from the Democratic, Democratic Republic, Republic of, Congo. of Congo. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Um. Wait. Does it still exist? I I I have to look these things up because like the problem is um. Like. Central Africa, especially, is just a nightmare in terms of like countries' existence because the Europeans did terrible things to Africa, um, in terms of like, like everything, like everything, awful. We did many awful. of the bad things. It, it, it bad, just bad in every conceivable way, um. So the Congo Basin is the sedimentary basin of the Congo River, which in simple terms, they're regions that move a bunch of sediment that eventually form sedimentary rock. So like it's it's like an accelerated watershed in a sense. Oh, okay. It's like a it's like a watershed with rocks, effectively. Um everybody likes so, rocks. Yeah, that's true. They rock. Um There's, no. <laughs> no. Uh, that's also kind of important because uh, that means that there should be a fairly prominent fossil record in that region, and like, because sedimentary rock is the most is is where fossils are found and stuff like that, which will probably come up later in the episode in part two, not in part one, because part one doesn't even get to fucking modern science, Brandon. <laughs> um, so uh, some of the Earth's largest undisturbed rainforests are found in this region, making it home to the Okapi. Western lowland gorillas, bonobo, and a plethora of other animals. To many believers that in this week's cryptid, this is evidence in support of prehistoric animal living in the region. Which, to their credit, and this is the only credit I'm going to give them in this two-part series, uh, yeah, there are undiscovered species in the Congo River Basin. Yep. One of the one of the expeditions we're going to talk about in the future found a form of green algae that was new, a new species of green algae, which is cool. But uh, it's really unlikely that they're fauna or macrofauna, like macrofauna especially. Yeah. Anything bigger than a f anything bigger than a mouse or a fruit bat, I'm going to assume is not going to be an undiscovered species. Yeah, I, I mean the the most common. I think I mentioned this before. Um, discovery it's of of new uh, species are. Um, what we thought were color morphs or just uh, an existing species where one just happened to be differently colored. And it turns out, no, that color morph is actually an entirely different species. Also, you didn't no mention that bonobos like to fuck. They really do. That is true. That, did that's you, did you the have first thing I learned in school about them. Were you made to watch Humanzy? Yes, I watched Humanzy. Yeah, that's a weird movie. Yeah, it's weird that it's weird that they made us watch that in school. I don't know if I, I know I watched it not in school, but I don't re recall having watched it in school. We had to watch it. I had to watch a part of it at least in school. It was, it was weird. I miss watching stuff in school. What I want to get for the house is a uh, a big CRT TV that I can strap onto a rolling cart with straps going over the top. <laughs> I was about to ask you if that's what you wanted to do. I miss those so much. And the projectors where you have to like write on the clear plastic and sheet and slide it on top. We watched Shrek. Fucking sweet. <laughs> <laughs> it just has a copy of Shrek stuck in it, like lodged in it. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing you can watch ever. Are you going to watch you the new, new, new Shrek in 3D? What? Next month, it, it's hitting theaters. Well, and if you have HBO Max, you can watch it. it, it, it you need a 3D TV, though. Or you can watch it in it, 2D, I guess. Is it the original Shrek, or is it a new Shrek? No, it's a new Shrek. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's... You sound sad, which you shouldn't be, because I just lied to you. Okay, I was about to say, because, yeah. like, one, 3D TVs don't exist anymore. Uh, no one's making home... Media because nobody wants 3D. Actually, there's a... Who is it? I saw a bunch of YouTube ads for a new 3D monitor that they were pitching for, um, like, YouTubers. And I was like, why? These have already failed. Nobody wants that. Like, nobody honestly, wants that. We've, we've actually bypassed 3D and moved straight to VR. Yeah. Because the thing is, 3D was effectively a stopgap to VR. So... Yeah. Okay, whatever. Um, anywho. 
I would also be remiss if I didn't also mention that the region was fully colonized by Belgium, France, and Portugal in the 19th century, which is extremely critical. Um, because I have a feeling it has something to do with the origins of this story that which I'm not even sense. getting into this week. I have a hypothesis for what uh, Mokile Membe is, at least the ones that the Europeans describe. And uh, spoiler alert, I have a strong suspicion it's fucking with the asshole white people who are who are dominating our area for no good fucking reason. Because <laughs> um, that's effectively what the Yeti is. It's a mm-hmm. fuck you white people. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, uh, I, I think I think we underestimate how much, how likely those types of stories are in history, where it's just like a we purposely trained him poorly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a very uh, what you call it, um, Kung Pao Enter the Fist. Movie. Yes, um, I missed that movie. I just watched Kung Fu Hustle the other day. That's that's a good movie. That's an actually well done movie. Stephen Chow. Um, yep. It's a lot slower than it's a lot like more classically structured as a movie and a lot slower than Kung Pao yep. though. Um but Stephen Chow films are generally like that. Yeah. Uh, they they very heavily rely on the hero's journey and frequently pre um uh pre like the mermaid, they featured Stephen Chow as like the main character. Yeah. So um but they're pretty good in general. I think they're very really funny movies. Yeah, they're good. Um, and it just real Jalen Shocker is pretty good. He's good and Bruce Lung was the um the played the beast in the movie, like that older guy who did like the frog style stuff, but I didn't realize he was I didn't realize that was Bruce Lung. He was like back in the day when like kung fu movies were like big. It's L E U N G if you're looking for it. It was him, uh Bruce Lung, Bruce Lee, and Jackie Chan were like the three big names when that style of movie was big. I was, I was and then he this, kind of so, fell off the map, or and then I. So if he looks familiar, or I mean, I didn't recognize him, but it was like, oh damn, that's him. When I figured it out, I caught myself from saying something really ignorant, and I'm not gonna even mention it. Okay. <laughs> outside of that, so. Oh yeah, him. Okay. Yeah, I was like, damn, he, that's that guy. I love um, that guy. So Brandon. It's time to get to the fucking monkey. Let's get to the monkey. Minutes in. Give me Brandon, the monkey. John, get ready. I, I want your get, monkey. Get fucking ready for this shit. <laughs> Give me, I'm, so cover, much, I'm covering myself in Vaseline. This is going to be a long ass episode. I'm just saying that at the top. I'm sorry. It's a long ass episode because there's a lot. There's a lot. And I feel like I feel like these are the episodes that people like where I'm just upset the whole episode. So guess what? This is the episode you're getting. You ask for it for months, for years even. You're getting it. <laughs> and it's going to be long. Because if I have to be angry, you're going to suffer. Um, so much like its distant cover- cousin, the Loch Ness Monster, Western knowledge of Mokile Membe has its roots in the early 1900s. The earliest account of Mokile Membe can be found in Carl Hagenbeck's 1909 book, Beasts in Men, being Carl Hagenbeck's experience for half a century among wild animals. That's the full title. Really, it's Beast and Men, and then the other stuff is a subtitle, but I wanted to read the whole thing because guess what? Uh, <laughs> so, thankfully, the book is fully in the public domain, so I can reproduce the section whole cloth for this episode, and I just spit all over my monitor saying cloth. Um, please, know, please know that the language in this section is not my own, even though I've already edited it, uh, but... Those of an individual who I don't respect in any way, shape, or fucking form. <clears throat> Some years ago, I received reports from two quite distinct sources of the existence of an immense and wholly unknown animal said to inhabit the interior of Rhodesia. Almost identical stories reached me. Firstly, through one of my own travelers, and secondly, through an English gentleman who had been shooting big game in Central Amer- Africa. The reports were thus quite independent of each other, and as a matter of fact, the Englishman and my traveler had made their way into Rhodesia from opposite directions, 
one from the northeast and the other from the southwest. The natives, it seemed, had told both my informants in that, that in the depth of great swamps there dwelt a huge monster, half elephant, half dragon. This, however, is not the only evidence of the existence of the animal. It is now several decades ago since Mengis, who of course is perfectly reliable, heard a precisely similar story. Um, and this is the part that I had to cut out because it uses the N word. It, it uses an N word that I don't want to use on the podcast. Uh, and still more remarkable, on the walls of certain caverns in Central Africa, there are to be found actual drawings of the strange creature. I feel like I, I, I was very conflicted about whether I wanted to remove that or not mm-hmm. um, because I don't want to say it, but like I do want to draw attention to the fact that this man was using uh, yeah. stuff because like I don't want to erase the fact that that historically happened and like, don't get me wrong. I'm about to tear this dude a, a new one. Um, but I chose not to say it for the sake of not wanting to say it, which might be a mealy way of doing it. I thought about, I thought about, uh, Dave Anthony on the dollop. Yeah. Um, I just don't have Dave Anthony's confidence. Okay. (laughs) And like willingness to commit to like saying things. Um, so yeah. Uh, from what I heard of the animal, it seems to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the brontosaurus. As the stories from so many different sources and all tend to substantiate each other, I am almost convinced that some such reptile must still be in existence. At great expense, therefore, I sent an expedition to find the monster, but unfortunately, they were compelled to return home without finding fine proof of anything, either one way or the other. In the part of Africa where the animals the animal is said to exist, there are enormous swamps, hundreds of square miles in extent, and my travelers were laid low with very severe attacks of fever. Moreover, that region is infested by bloodthirsty savages who repeatedly attacked the expedition and hindered its advance. Notwithstanding this failure, I have not relinquished the hope of being present being able to present the science with indisputable evidence of the existence of the monster. And perhaps if I succeeded in the enterprise, naturalists all over the world would be roused to hunt vigorously for the other unknown animals. For if this prodigious dinosaur, which supposedly is supposed to have been extinct for hundreds of thousands of years, be still in existence, what other wonders might not be brought to light? So, not to say that he had some uh, flaws in his research, but I'm pretty sure the Brontosaurus isn't a real dinosaur. Um, and he's thinking a Patasaurus, because it wasn't Brontosaurus the one made up during the Bone Wars? Uh, it's more complicated than that, actually. Oh, fun. Brontosaurus might actually be a species of dinosaur. I, I was reading the research on it because I was going to call that out. And it's really confusing. It it's it's super confusing. Um, because like I think in 2015 somebody said that it was another like it was a part of a ge- like its own species because it was originally a subspecies of Apatosaurus. Well, it was originally its own species. Then it got changed into being a subspecies, and now it's back to potentially being its own species. Although I don't know if it's necessarily the same skeletal structure. And bone structure, it might just be that they named it Brontosaurus for the sake of, like, bringing that creature back into existence. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, Brandon. It's not my area of science, and it's super hard for me to follow. And I'm not even gonna even remotely begin to unpack that. Okay. Um, but also, uh, you can't. That's one thing I won't critique him for because, um. Modern science at the time did believe that Brontosaurus was a real s- creature, regardless of its status as a real one or not now. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like, like everyone kind of believed that it was real. So it's not one of those situations where, um, like there was a, that like real scientists didn't think it was real. Real scientists thought it was real. So, um, the description he gives is incredibly basic. The creature is described as being half elephant and half dragon, and then compared to the brontosaurus, which, as I mentioned and you mentioned, is a contentious animal. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, Carl focuses more on the surrounding story than the actual creature, which makes sense given he himself hasn't seen the creature. However, the account is practically a footnote in, in a larger book. Interestingly, his account doesn't really differ all that much from modern appeals to cryptids existing. In fact, if we were playing cryptid bingo, I'd be walking home with an electric blanket on this one. Um, because the first account is in a region that isn't remotely close to the area where the creature is famous for. Seriously, Brandon, Rhodesia is modern-day Zimbabwe, which is approximately one Zambia away from the Congo <laughs> River Basin. Uh, second, the, uh, the description uh, of the creature is vaguely specific. Carl provides no meaningful description of the attributes, but synthesizes it to be a brontosaurus for the reader, which is kind of a hallmark of most cryptid sightings, as it's like, oh, it's this thing. Um, I don't give you any evidence that it's this thing, but it's this thing, believe me. Uh, then there's an appeal to tradition, as he claims that the creature, which hasn't been sufficiently described, has appeared in cave paintings of the region. So it's like, you know, mm. oh, well, the people, the locals say it exists... Um, yeah. Look at these pictures. They exist. Yada yada yada. It's that's a super common thing. It kind of goes back to Mantis Man as well. Yeah. Here's the petro petroglyph that I'll use to affirm my own statement. Exactly. Um, additionally, he makes the off repeated argument. Look at how large the swamp, the Aryan swamps are. Couldn't you imagine something like this living here? Ah. Uh, um, no I one would ever use that argument for anything ever. Which is always used. Um, which. I will give him a bit of credit on this one. Um, I don't think he's... He's not... So... At that time... You didn't have satellites. No. So, like... Nobody really knew how big that area was or what the fuck was in it who was European. The people who lived there knew what it was, what was in it, but not the fucking assholes who were conquering it. Um... And the last free space on my bingo card was a white guy taking control of a situation you really didn't need to, which is pretty much every cryptid story. Yeah. What's the, I was confused by the electric blanket. I don't, I don't is that like a prize you get when you win bingo? It, yeah. Like it was, it was a joke. Like, cause it's usually like at a old folks home. So like they have an electric <laughs> blanket and like they like it because it's warm. <laughs> old people are like cats. They like warm things. I mean, I like warm things, so, like, it kind of would work for me, too. There's, I have an electric it, blanket if you want one. No, I don't, because I, I actually am scared of electric blankets for, like, uh, overheating reasons. Okay. <laughs> I, I, have, I have really bizarre fears, like, that are grounded in the idea of things catching fire. Fire is basically my one true fear, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. Yeah, you and Frankenstein. Yeah, I'm, monster. I might, I might be Frankenstein's monster. You might. That would make that answer a lot of questions. Actually, it would answer a lot of questions. Yeah, like my ability to freak, speak French, which I'm not going to to show you right now. Frankenstein's okay. monster for speaking French. Did he speak French? Yeah, in the book he spoke French. Mary Shelley, you you're crazy. Ah, no, not really, because the idea was he was like hyper intelligent. Like, um, I think I think oh. the real horror of Frankenstein's monster was like the idea that he would replace humanity as well, because he was just a better form of human. Yeah, effectively. Um, so yeah. Now, on to Carl Hagenbeck himself. Hagenbeck himself. He's a problematic historical figure. As all, like, as most white people are in this generation, particularly white explorers, he's incredibly <laughs> problematic. White explorers have never done anything wrong ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's hailed for being the father of the modern zoo, which is already... There you go. <laughs> kind of... Kind of already a, uh, a strike in the problematic column for him. Yeah. Um... Because also, the I cause have, for some cryptid sightings is animals escaping zoos. Yeah, so I have, like, I have, two, there's two types of zoos in my book. Um, the Bronx Zoo, which is okay, 
mainly because it promotes conservation and if it's re rehabilitatory and all that kind of stuff, I'm okay with it. Um, actually, I'm going to amend it. It's, there's three zoos. Bronx Zoo type zoos that do conservation. Uh, local zoos that are like local fauna, right? That they're keeping. Yeah. Like, like usually domesticated animals. If it's just mm -hmm. domesticated animals, that's fine because it's not like they're suffering in any way, typically. Um, effectively, it's a farm, really, at the end of the day. Um, and then there's Tiger King zoos, which I are basically every other zoo, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so I, I, zoos and me have a weird relationship. Effectively, I, I'm just not I'm a zoo fan. I so uh, I like being able to see animals, but like I'm also super deeply conflicted by it because it's like. Well, so it's like, difficult because so certain animals' habitats have been destroyed by humanity, right? Yeah. And, like, ethically speaking, I don't want those species to go extinct, and zoos are kind of the only way they can avoid being extinctified. Yeah, but, like, if they provide the right things. Like, the, the th kind of zoos I don't like is the zoo... I just bumped my mic. Second time this episode. Um... Like the zoo by my house, if you know the, where that is, the one um, by where yeah, there's like the one. stadium and all that, or they yeah, yeah. have like a cow in like a cage the size of this office. <laughs> like that's yeah, that that's not that's, cool. That's rough. That's a rough one too. <laughs> like that. Uh, it's like that 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 zoo is just filled with like animals <laughs> in cages the size of a room, and they're all bigger than me. And I'm like, that doesn't seem cool. It's it's pro it's all problematic, Brandon. Yeah, <laughs> it's all problematic. But he's even more problematic. Okay. Oh yeah, I believe it. Um. So I guess in a slight pro column for him, though, he was the one who made the open habitats like a thing. Um. The open habitats was, are cool. It was named the Hagenbach Revolution. Hagenbach Revolution. Um. But he's overall an absolute jerk, right? Like. What he did was a ba basically make zoos more palatable to people, which, in its own right, is kind of fucked. You know, like, it, there's layers of fuckedness to this, is yeah. what I'm going to say. He's it's, like it's a, a fucked fuck onion. It's a fuck shit stack. It's a it's fuck, a fuck shit, shit stack. Oh, deep cut. Fuck shit stack, for sure. He's a fuck lasagna. So, he was a wild animal merchant. Cool. Who sold exotic animals to European zoos and Cryptopedia favorite P.T. Barnum. <laughs> also, so never already, did anything wrong. I already hate him. Like, I, when I found that out, I hated him outright for that reason alone. Worse, however, he was uh, something known as an ethnography showman. Now, Brandon. That's exactly as disgusting as it sounds if you know what ethnography means. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say that this, these sentences, great transition to my episode coming up. <laughs> really? Uh, it's another grab bag, so the third one oh, is... Oh, uh... God. <laughs> so, now, ethnography is like cultural study, right? It's the showman bit. <laughs> the yeah, showman the bit. showman bit. That's the problem there, especially. Um, because these people aren't choosing to share their culture. And he would display living humans next to zoo animals as an exhibit of savages in a natural state. Which I didn't even mention the fact that he used the term bloodthirsty savages in his write-up of the Mokile Membe, which he didn't name, by the way. Yeah. Um which is really just a, a shitty white European at the turn of the century saying, Yeah, people weren't happy that we were like intruding on their land, so we're just gonna yeah. call them savages. They're, they're not bloodthirsty. They're pissed off because you're fucking up their whole thing. Yeah. It's like if I walked onto your property and took a shit on it. Um They're I not mean, bloodthirsty. That could be good content. That <laughs> I mean, it might be good content, but like a lot of people would be pissed off. I guess they. I guess primarily my they, neighbors. 
maybe bloodthirsty would be the correct term, but not because the person is bloodthirsty by their own merits, but because you just did something that pissed them off enough that they want to kill you. Yeah, it's the European guy kidnapping all your shit and be like, this mine now. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So, uh, fuck him. Fuck him. Um, luckily, he died. I mean, obviously he's dead because it's 1909, but he died in a violent way. April 14th, oh. 1913, to a snake bite from a boom slang. An animal that had literally no business being in Germany because it's from, like, South Africa. That it's sounds sick. like a cryptid in itself. Um, it's actually less of a cryptid and more of just, like, a German, like, poor man, too. Oh, it's a cool, is a large venomous snake found in Africa. Oh, okay. It's a tree yeah. snake. Basically. Um, so it's from this auspicious naturalist we got our first description of the creature that become known as Mokile Membe. Now, not named at this point. I want to remind you, it's not named. Because the next bit is going to blow your mind that they didn't have a name for it yet. So, in addition to Carl's description, one of his supposed sources, Hans Schomenberg, saw that there was a lack of hippopotami at Lake Bangwelu in modern-day Zambia. Reportedly, his guide claimed there was a large hippo-killing creature in the lake, although Hans didn't fully believe him. And I kind of side with Hans a little bit. I wouldn't side with Hans. I would think the uh, more likely explanation for a lack of hippopotami in a zoo is because they're, or in any area, is because they're fucking hippo. Yeah, so like, the reason I kind of believe his lack of belief is because, like, he's a big... I'm pretty sure he was, like, effectively a big game hunter at the time. Yeah, like, so, hu like hunting... And am I wrong in thinking that hippos are, are, like, moving water more than lakes? Or are they more like a river than a... They're, they're like, everywhere. Are they everywhere? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they're they're also, like, super violent and probably way scarier than Mokila Membe. Oh, yeah. Like, as described. Uh, kill um, more people than uh, the crocodiles. Crocodiles, yeah, it's yeah. it's a serious thing. They're they're fucking vicious. Hippos aren't cute. They're murder machines. <laughs> they are just, just to murder. Let you know. What they're just water murder elephants. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um. So regardless of whether that was true or not, public consciousness was captured by the potential existence of the yet unnamed Mokila Membe, and now Brandon. I want to remind you, I read you everything that the public had on Mokila Membe from 1909 to 1911. Yes. That is everything. That is everything that was reported on it for three years, two years, nearly three years. But people lost their fucking minds over the thing. <laughs> they fucking loved it. They ate that shit right up. Because people love brontosauruses and they fucking love dinosaurs. Why do you think there's been like four, there's been three po Power Ranger seasons that have dinosaurs? No, four. Four Power Ranger seasons that have dinosaurs. Because dinosaurs because are cool. people fucking love dinosaurs. Full stop. Right? Like, yeah. that's just it. People fucking love They're those cool. things. They're in all the movies. Yeah, everyone loves dinosaurs. There's a reason why Jurassic Park is so loved. And not just because it has phenomenal cinematography, a really amazing application of 3D CGI merged with practical effects. It's got fucking dinosaurs. And Chris Pratt. I'm not talking about that one. Okay. I'm talking about the one where Newman dies. Uh, also a good movie because Newman dies. Yes, yes. Why do people like um, dinosaurs? Because they kill Newman. Mm -hmm. And lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, it wasn't until a diary entry in 1911 from Lieutenant Paul Gratz that more information on the creature surfaced. And, Brandon, I don't even know if this was made public in the early 1900s. So, hooray. I have no idea when this reached public consciousness. <laughs> the crocodile is found only in very isolated specimens in Lake Bangalore, except in the mouths of the large rivers at the north. In the swamp lives the Sangha, much feared by the natives, De a degenerate saurian, 
which one might confuse with the crocodile were it not that it has skin with no scales and its toes are armed with claws, which I'm pretty sure crocodiles have claws on their toes. Yes. I did not succeed in shooting an Asanga, but on the island of Mbala, Mbala, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm really bad at pronunciation, which if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know, um, I came by some strips of its skin. Um, so there's slightly more meat on the bones of the description. However, it's incredibly lacking still. And it more or less matches with pulp descriptions of the Brontosaurus, but only superficially. Um, I want to point out again, like, the depictions of Brontosaurus that everyone was familiar with are totally fucking wrong. If you're, imagine Brontosaurus in your head. Imagine, uh, imagine an Apatosaurus in your head. You're probably wrong. Whatever you're thinking of right now, <laughs> probably not what it looked like. Almost guaranteed, folks. Yeah, um, a lot of uh, artistic license back in the day. Yeah, like, almost guaranteed that's not what that creature looked like. Like, pretty much, like, I can almost... I don't like doing 100%, like, facts, but I'm pretty close to 100% that it's not what it looked like. <laughs> People were paid to come up, imagine what they looked like, and, like... They weren't. They weren't necessarily scientists. It was newspaper paper people, people who were trying to sell Euro, yellow journalism, get butts and seats to pay that ten cents to read that article and see that picture. So yeah, <sighs> it should be noted that Lieutenant Paul Gratz had been seeking to discover a new species as well on his journey. Um, so he might have been primed to just believe anything people said. Yeah. Uh, for the sake of finding anything. Also, in the book, uh, there's this wonderful gem. The book that I found this in, um, which was... Uh, give me a second. I'm trying to remember what the name of the book was. The Great North, The Great Road North, which is like... I think it was a story about him. Um... Which is also part of the reason why I literally don't know when people found out about this book. Like, like this diary entry, because it could have been, like, way after the fact. Because, like, diary entries aren't always released to the public. Yeah. Obviously. Because it's a diary. Um, yeah. So, this wonderful gem immediately follows the section that I read. Great spent three months in the Banguelo region. He carried a supply of artificial eyes which enabled him to pose as a magician. Many many a one-eye African received a new eye from Gates. Greats. Like actual eyes? Like glass eyes? I'm assuming yes. That's what it means. If I'm reading that correctly. And why are there so many people with only one eye? I mean, that just happens. Like, that, that just happens to people. Like, what I'm kind sure of fucking happened. magician are the? I'm just confused. Like, it was a puzzle magician, but with him with eyeballs. Yeah, I, I don't know. It was. Fu- it's weird. It's weird. It's weird. It's yeah. weird. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Um, I mean, also, like, we're talking about early 1900s, so like, um, there's probably less of a chance that there's techniques for saving an eyeball. Uh, yeah. Like, like we also have to acknowledge that the the 20th century had a lot of medical advances in it. Like, a lot, lot. Um, like, at the start of the 20th century, we weren't that far away from bloodletting, folks. Yeah. Do we? I think we still... Well, some weirdos still do bl- the well, bloodletting. bloodletting... Bloodletting, I think, has certain uses. Like, very, very... But, like, it's very narrow. It's only good if your humans are, humors are off balance. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it has... There, there is. Uh, one second. There's, I, there's a few infections that still use it. Really? Yeah. Uh, polycythemia. Well, it's different. It's not just like cutting someone or whatever. It's probably closer to like, like dialysis, like re- removal, yeah. filtration, and yeah, of, yeah, of, cause, cause, yeah. So polycythemia is an increase in the number of red blood cells in the body. Which causes the blood to be thicker. So it's it's literally like cleaning red blood cells out. It's not the same. Like, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's not like they're just slitting people's wrists to let blood out 
for the sake of doing it. It's like if there's a legitimate blood condition that the blood needs to be removed for some reason. Um, Cause like I'm looking at all these and all these are, are all the ones. Yeah. Iron overload. They're all relating to diseases of, uh, of the blood pretty much. Yeah. So it's not just like for what ails you. It's for yeah. like, this is a very specific treatment for this very specific problem that is very specific to the blood. Um, how do we get here? Because I was talking about medical advances and we were talking about a, a fucking guy who was handing out eyes like he's fucking Johnny Appleseed of the eyeball. What's up? Well, I feel like you're. I, I, you just, you just oh, kind of went silent. So oh, I, I, like I, I, I was up. populating the spreadsheet. <laughs> I was making sure I didn't forget to populate that spreadsheet. The eyeball spreadsheet. The eyeball spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. We have to track those eyeballs. So, Mokila Membe was finally named in the next popular account of the creature, made by Ludwig Fieder von Stein zu Lausens. I think that's pretty much right. I'd call that close enough. Um, he, doesn't have an, he doesn't have an English Wikipedia article, by the way. I found that out. There's, I also um, found that German Wikipedia is better, as long as you can find English versions, a lot, there's a lot more information than the uh, English uh, Wikipedia. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counter you on that. Um, more information isn't necessarily better because I got a fucking thing I found. Oh no! Watch reading this, re studying, like researching this whole thing. So before that, let's finish the this part. Um, so he was a German captain who was ordered to conduct a survey of the German colonies in modern day Cameroon, 1913. Von Stein was said to have aggregated stories about a large reptile named Mokila Membe that lived in the jungles of Cameroon. Although his initial report was reportedly carefully worded, Von Stein appears to have found the stories credible. He trusted the guides who recounted the stories to him and found similarity between independent sources' stories. The following is supposedly a reproduction from Von Stein's formerly unpublished source... From what Willie Lay's Exotic Animals, released in 1959. The animal is said to be of a brownish gray color with smooth skin. Its size is approximately that of an elephant, at least that of a hippopotamus. It is said to have a very long, very flexible neck, and only one tooth, but a very long one. Some say it is a horn. A few spoke about the long, muscular -like, tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animal is said to attack the vessels at once and kill the crews without eat, but without eating the bodies. Um, so it's just a murder beast, like a cat. Uh, it's a giant cat, is what we're saying. Um, the creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of, the, of its shores at sharp bends. It is said to climb the shores even at daytime in search of food. It is, its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. This feature disagrees with a possible explanation as a myth. The preferred plant was shown to me. It is a kind of liliana with large white blossoms with a milky sap and apple-like fruits. At the Sombo River, I was shown a path said to have been made by the animal in order to get at its food. The path was fresh, and there were plants of the described type nearby, but since there were too many tracks of elephants, hippos, and other large mammals, it was impossible to make out a particular spore with any amount of certainty. So, this is the most specific description of Mukila Membe and the first one that actually names it. Um, I took this from a archive.org reproduction scan of Willie Lay's Exotic Animals, the 1959 edition. Um, so... Theoretically, it was published. Yeah, I love archive.org. They're doing the good stuff. Um, no, archive.org is really important for this episode because it, it gave me a lot of primary sources to look at, which this is not a primary source, by the way. This is, this is a secondary source that's aggregating a primary source, theoretically. So, without a doubt, as I said, this is the most specific... 
description of the creature to date in the story as it describes not only its appearance, but its diet and behavior, which, um, zoologically speaking, is super important. Yeah. Um, because now we can actually start to make, like, assessments of the creature, which I'm not doing in this episode because I got derailed in a few a few sentences. Um, interestingly and importantly, Cameroon is quite a ways away from Lake Bangawelu. In fact, literally on the other side of the basin away. <laughs> you know, the 3.7 million square kilometers. Yeah. Oh, geez. Literal opposite side. It's a bit of a trek. Yeah. So um, either this thing is like all over the Congo River Basin or something's not adding up. Um, and people live in the Congo River Basin. I know there's a lot of undisturbed rainforest, but like people live there. Right. Yeah. Modern day people live there. Uh, so um, also Willie Lay's book, super problematic in its own right. Um, it was not peer reviewed in any way, shape, or form, effectively, and it's super so- pseudoscientific. So, like everything I just read, take that with a great salt, and also recognize that that report may not have been released until 1959 ish. <laughs> so, Mokila Membe uh, was not named officially until then, effectively, and and not only that, Brandon. It's a, like a footnote inside of a story about Ishtar Gate, yeah. which is its own episode that I forgot entirely about Ishtar Gate. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Brandon, this story's fucking wild and so confusing to me. Sounds like it's got um, a lot of branches. It does. The thing that's most confusing about it to me is, like, I thought that Mokila Membe was, like, this big, like, stand on its own cryptid. But really, it's one of those cryptids that, like, shoots off of a bunch of other cryptids and, like, yeah. is told in passing and, like, fragmentary, um, which is kind of different than a lot of, like, historic cryptids. Because usually, usually stuff like Loch Ness Monster stands on its own. It's its own story. It's it's discreet from other things. Mokile Membe is mixed in with a bunch of other shit, right? Um, and it's usually not the focus of whatever is happening. Um, like, for example, the, the first appearance of it is a footnote in a book about the dude's life. It's his memoir, right? Um, he didn't release that to the public. It wasn't like a news article or anything. He just mentions it offhandly. And then, like, media takes it and runs with it, and people love it, and, like, it's a whole thing, right? And then, like, this story is a subsection of a larger story about an actually historical thing, Right? Um, but people, of course, take actual historic things and describe additional meaning to them, which Ishtar Gate is definitely one of those things, <laughs> which is a Sumerian, a piece of Sumerian art, if my memory is correct. Um, it's been a while since I read up on it. Uh, something about depictions of dragons or what have you, and people think, oh, well, they sh- they they painted it, so it must oh, be real. Oh, is that what that's from? I was trying to it, remember what Ishtar Gate was. Yeah, I think think that's the case so like um uh so like that's but that's like a super a super common trend oh yeah like people yeah it's it's actually really it's beautiful it's a beautiful 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 and it's in it's it's in babylon i was wrong um it's gorgeous it's a it's it's like this blue like navy blue with like gold filigree and inlays and it's it's a wonderful piece of uh, BC like pre Christian Christianity art, and it's just truly beautiful to look at. Um, but beside the point, it, it it's also Mesopotamian. I was so far off, actually not really that far off, but I was off. Um, but anywho, so. This is me, like Brandon. This is how frazzled I am by this episode. I can't keep a straight thought on it <laughs> because, like, there's so much, like, intertwined in this particular story, and that's why I'm so, 
insane right now. <laughs> and Brandon, I picked the worst fucking time to do this episode because I've got so much shit I need to get done still. And like <laughs> this manic energy is now consuming me. Um, so in 1927, Alfred Aloysius Smith, an ivory trader, released a memoir in which he described two creatures, Jagonini and Amali. In his account, he had encountered stories of them in his travels in the 1800s. I and behind the Cameroon, there's things living we know nothing about. I could have uh, made books about many things. The Jagonini, they say, is still in the swamps and rivers. Giant diver, it means. Comes out of the water and devours people. Old men will tell you it's what their grandfathers saw, but they still believe it's there. Same as the Amali. I've always taken it to be. I've seen the Amali's footprint, about the, good, about the size of a good frying pan in circumference, and three claws instead of five. I don't know why three claws instead of five is a thing. Oh, no, never mind. Three-toed things are, like, a super common, like, motif in cryptid sightings and stuff like that. So, never mind. Never mind. Um, I answered my own question. <laughs> in cryptids and sloths. Yes. Yes. Or two toes for sloths. Remember that. Yeah. They exist, too. Um, so, at this point, I began to lose hope, Brandon, while I was writing the story. Because I have no idea what the fuck is going on still. There's very little connected fiber between all these things. Like, they're only similar... Like, most of these are only similar in the fact that they are describing a reptilian creature that is in the same region. Yeah. And sometimes it's sauropod-ish. Other times it's barely described. But, Brandon... Yes? This is all a part of the canon of (laughs) Mokile Membe. This is the canon. What I'm telling you is the canon. Yeah. Right? So, um, I have made a choice in doing this episode. And, like, many episodes before this, I use credulous sources to tell the story. Right? Because credulous sources are more or less the canon that people who believe in this believe. Right? Um, People who are willing to believe have their story, they have their narrative. That's important because that's what they view as proof of what's happening, right? And then we, as people who are reading and like, you know, there is a part of me that hopes that a cryptid's real, right? Like a like a mythical supernatural being is real because that's kind of a little fun, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's a bit of fun in that. But, but Brandon... It's also important to review your sources and review what's going on. So, Brandon, <laughs> what, I'm about to, what I'm about to talk to you about was what I thought was just going to lead me into, like, going into the modern era. Yeah. But it doesn't. Ooh, tasty. So... Before the cryptozoologist arrived on the scene, there was at least one more instance in which the creature was supposedly alluded to. Now, I'm saying this from the credulous source perspective, okay? Just keep that in mind. Yeah. All that I'm about to read to you, this is what what is believed by people who believe in Mokile Membe. In 1919 to 1920, the Smithsonian Institute sought to document the life in the interior of Africa, as the story goes, a 32-man expedition set out in 1919 to gather flora and fauna specimens, as well as record the film of living creatures. The story, according to the dailyjournalist.com, which I'm calling out specifically because this is the thing that I was using as my uh, guide to navigate the story and like find things to explore and d- dive down, is as follows. According to cryptozoologists Lauren Coleman and Patrick Hugh, authors of The Field Guide to Lake Monsters, Africans' guides found large unexplained tracks along the bank of a river and later in a swamp. The team heard mysterious roars, which had no resemblance with any known animal. However, the expedition was to end in tragedy. During a train ride through flooded, a flooded area where an entire tribe was said to have seen the dinosaur, the locomotive suddenly derailed and turned over. 
four team members were crushed to death under the cars and another half dozen seriously injured. The expedition was documented in the Homer L. Shantz papers. Okay. So, how familiar are you with the Smithsonian Institute? I am not. Is that different than, like, the is, is this an instance where someone is using the name of a well-known place in order to so l- this, give credibility to their own woo-woo shit? So, the Smithsonian is, like, a legit-ass science organization that's... Well, I know the Smithsonian centered. is, but is yes, that that's, different than the Smithsonian Institute? No, no, that's 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 at, like the They're Smithsonian the Institute is a part of that giant umbrella, right? So, Brandon, yes, the Smithsonian Institute is actual science, and what does actual science do? It takes a fuck ton of notes. Yep. So, this is a fairly serious story of truth. Yeah, right. like a whole train flipped over and people well, died. That, that and not only that, but like this would be recorded if they heard monstrous screams or whatever. Yeah. It would be a big fucking deal to the story. So, as I said before, up until this point, I've been using the Daily Journal's article as a rough timeline, seeking primary sources when possible. So, I... um. Type into Google, Smithsonian Institute, 1919 to 1920, Africa. It yielded a history of the expedition to the Smithsonian Archives, right? On the Smithsonian Archives. Um, So this article that I was basing it off of was from four years ago, which is 2017, right? Pretty sure that this article was available on the Smithsonian Institute at that time. Whatever. So it did yield a history of the expedition, um, on the Smithsonian Archives. Superficially, there are some similarities to the expedition described in the article. So this, there, there was, in fact, an expedition that lasted from 2019, uh, not 2019, 1919 to 1920. That existed. There's incontrovertible fact that that was a thing. Okay. Um, the objective of the Smithsonian Universal Film Manufacturing Company African expedition was to secure additional specimens of plants and animals, primarily from the interior of Africa as well as South Africa. It began on July 16th, 1919 and ended July 14th, 1920. So, real as shit. Right? Um, the Smithsonian Archive has it. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that this actually happened. Yeah, that there right? was that an this expedition. Is, this is in their records. I'm inclined to believe this actually happened. So, no major red flags yet, right? Um, for the most part, the description matches, although there's no description of the number of members, but it looked like it was not 32. So I was starting to get a little bit, you know, whatever. Um, however, they have a description of the incident involving the trade. Oh, oh, good. I'm sure it's highly similar to what was reported. During the expedition... There was a railroad incident in which two members of the expedition died. Joseph Armstrong, business director, and William Stowell, cinematographer and director. Immediately afterward, the institution, the institution received conflicting accounts about which two members died. Um, but ultimately, it was those two people, right? So, so two people died. Is that where the four people come from in the original article? Is that there were two different conflicting and they just said instead of two and like they just got four no 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 that's not where it came from um uh so that's that's a hole forming in the the, the the daily journal article um the number of deaths has changed um and uh i found a pretty so wikipedia has its faults but there is one really good thing about wikipedia People love to fucking talk in the talk thread when an article is bad. Oh, yeah. Like, a lot. And the Mokila Membe article is terrible. It is one of the worst articles on Wikipedia I've ever seen. Full stop. Um, like, the citation of the, the, the uh, Willie Lay book was not even valid. I actually updated the citation so it was pointing to a real archive.org thing so like 
people could actually see that it was written somewhere. I yeah. don't necessarily think that it should be used as a source because I think Willie Lay might have juiced things a little bit, but that's a whole nother discussion that isn't even remotely related to all the shit I'm about to go over. So, the num- so in the Wikipedia talk article, which has a whole section about this particular story. Oh, does it? Good. Somebody, somebody, by the grace of whatever skeptical god exists, took this story and piece by piece broke it down. Okay? <laughs> uh-huh. So, um, and I want to say super thank you to Tron Villain, who is the Wikipedia user who collated all of this insane information. Um... So they had a New York Tribune article linked because they have a, a subscription to newspapers.org, which I don't have. So thank you once again. I'm so grateful to people who have, like, actual things sharing, like, clippings and stuff like that. Because, like, those types of people are the real champs in terms of research for stuff like this. Because, quite frankly, we can't do real research for this podcast, right? Like, I've said that before. I'll say it again. We're doing surface-level research. We're not doing true um, like ethnography or what have you, right? We're doing like just broad introductions to the topics, digging in a little bit here and there. Um, so the article itself was from Monday, December 8th, 1919, and it was titled Explorers Killed and Crashed. It turns out it wasn't nearly as salacious. So in the story that was published by the Daily Journal, um, the train derailed, right? Yeah. It's not what fucking happened, Brandon. They were stopped. The train was stopped, and a water truck collided with one of the, the, one of the cars, killing oh. two people and seriously injuring one. That's all that, like, that's, that's shitty, not great, but that's, like, not a derailment. That's like, different, yeah. That's so different in every way, shape, and form. Like, that's a car accident. Um, whoever wrote the article, or this passage at least, punched it up significantly um, to insinuate a connection to Macaulay Membe. Because they also added the in flooded areas where people blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right? There's no reason to add that whole subsection. And this is, I'm, I'm kind of tearing this apart just to kind of, like, highlight how terrible things can be and why you shouldn't necessarily believe everything you read. Um, because a lot of the times people punch shit up for the sake of selling papers or books or magazines or whatever the fuck they're selling because salacious sells. Yeah. That's the whole point of a book or magazine is to sell. That's it. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, even I right now am, like, making this a bigger deal than it probably should have. But it's more because I, I reached this point where I was doing the story and I found this and I just got really fucking pissed <laughs> that this is a whole thing. And I just said, fuck it. I'm finishing this episode out by doing a rabbit hole on this. So Homer L. Chance is all actually a real member of the expedition team, Brandon. Okay. And a botanist who did have a report. He has letters, reports, uh, telegrams, all that shit. I found the thing, once again, thanks to Tron Villain, who (coughs) posted a link to a University of Arizona archive that has a PDF of his records. Shit. (laughs) I'm getting a little too heated um, because the Transformer just fell on me. Uh, So... The problem is the source of like the the exact point where that happens. Yeah. There's almost fucking nothing on it. Like, like in terms of like even remotely close to anything cryptid wise. November 29th, 1919 collected plants in the morning, mostly for seed, several orchids of which I collected the bulbs after a long tiresome tramp returned to the camp around 1 p.m found the following telegram from Theory at Elizabeth, addressed to Chance at Cough. Railroad wreck, Congo, stop. Armstrong, Stowell, both killed. 
Stop. Other all right. Stop. Have cabled Barker for instruction and wired Heller. Stop. You cannot help by abandoning your trip. Stop. Suggest you wait further wi- Wait further wire from myself. Stop. Burying Armstrong today. Stop. Stowell tomorrow. Armstrong is business manager and Stowell director of movies. So two heads are removed at once. We knew no details of the work. Has cast gloom over whole endeavor. That is exactly what a fucking scientist would write in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I should also point out that's November 29th. Brandon. Yeah. The expedition ended July 14th. Yeah. That's nowhere near the end of the expedition. The expedition didn't end because people died. It kept going because there were still scientists. Yeah. They just lost the director and the fucking business manager. Yeah. So everything about, like, there's two kernels of truth in that whole article. That whole passage. Two kernels of truth. And they made it out to be so much more than it was. Or maybe I made it out to be so much more than it was. I don't fucking know. (laughs) I don't know. definitely one of them. I mean, one of those is true. I mean, I... My main problem, right, is, like, that's, whenever you deal with someone's, like, whenever you interject someone dying into a story, um, you're doing it for a reason, right? Yes. Um, if you're, you could be reporting just for the sake of reporting or something along those lines, but, like, let's be real, uh, whoever wrote this article was not doing it to report on it, right? Um... They were not doing this for the sake of providing information. They were taking kernels of truth and then telling lies about them. Because that's all it is. Because it's an expedition where people die, so let's make it juicy. Yes. So, like, um, I have a really big problem with people lying. And and maybe this is part of the reason why I freaked out over this so much. (laughs) I have a problem with people lying about how people died why people died and what happened when people died because to me that erases the life that was lived by that person um which is a bigger deal to me than anything else because uh there's that whole notion of two deaths right Mm -hmm. there's the first time you die physically and then the last time you die uh in the minds of people right it's yeah. the last time your name is ever uttered, anyone ever thinks about you, or whatever. Um, it's a philosophical thing. It, it's it's it, it's something that stuck with me pretty hard. And, like, I don't like the idea of people being used for a, as a puppet for an agenda or a story. Um, really, really does not resonate with me. Um, I don't... I'm also one of those people who doesn't believe in like speaking not speaking ill of the dead because you know for whatever reason because that also kind of kills that person in its own right Mm -hmm. um and like this is this is something that i philosophically thought about a lot in my life (laughs) and part of that is because of code of honor the beast wars episode oh um, lord because of because of dinobot in his quote at the end of that and like um, he's pretty great. Uh, I love Dinobot, and I hate the fact that so much of my philosophy is um, is like couched in Transformers. But <laughs> fucking, you know what? <laughs> Fuck it. Um. So, like in that episode, the final uh, thing that Dinobot said is. Uh, Tell my tale to those who ask. Tell it truly, the ill deeds along with the good, and let me be judged accordingly. The rest is silence. And that's something that's very important to me. Truth is important to me, right? Uh, I don't believe in twisting the truth. And this is a very long thing for me to say. I got really (laughs) mad because this is a lie. But Brandon, mm-hmm. 
they also lied about Lauren Coleman's quote. <laughs> uh, and he's somebody who is credulous of all of this. Yeah. Because what Lauren Coleman actually said, then in 1920, the Smithsonian Institute sent a 32-man expedition to Africa, which found unexplained tracks along the riverbed and heard mysterious roars. So, yeah, the substance is similar, but it's also completely different. And that's also a faulty number, as I mentioned before. Yeah. So I have no idea where Lauren Coleman got that number. Um, Cause I also didn't. So I got, I got the section of the book that had that quote in it, but I didn't get the rest of the book. So like, mm-hmm. I don't know if he has any citations or anything like that. I doubt it. I doubt it too. Um, but that is also a faulty account in its own right. Because the number is wrong. And not only that, but there's another newspaper article from 1920 that denies that the expedition had anything to do with brontosauri. Yeah. Whatsoever. Because apparently this was a thing that was spreading around the time. Like a, a legend. An, or like a, a myth. Which is fucking insane to me but Brandon this is still a key component in the lore of Mokile Membele and like I doubt the veracity of anything that we've read up until this point because of this (laughs) the only thing Brandon that I know for a fact happened at the time that it was said to have happened was the 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 line and passage written by Carl. Carl yeah. Heckenbeck or whatever. Heckbeck? Henbeck? Whatever. Hey, that dude that Carl fucking something. racist asshole. That racist asshole. That's the only part of this story that I know actually happened when they said it happened. Brandon. <laughs> Literally the only part of the story. And it fucking threw me for a loop. So, Brandon. Yes. I wasn't expecting the Daily Journalist to be a font of truth for this particular story. Oh, when I no. Started using it. I was not expecting it. I mean, the fucking article didn't even have an author. So yeah. I just assumed that this was one of those, like, oh, we copy and pasted this from somewhere, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. I just generally, like I said, I generally use these type of, like, listicle type things as mm-hmm. jumping off points and move from there. Um, And, like, my general philosophy when writing episodes is I don't start with the mask off typically because yeah. the fun is finding out that it was actually, so, you know, it's old man Jenkins at the start of the yeah, episode. You got to Scooby do it, but you gotta, you, you don't have an episode. If you just say it's, it's him in the yeah. beginning of the episode, right? You gotta have at least a few chases through hallways. Yeah. So and the article itself is like a memetic piece of text for cryptozoology. Like, it's a very common trend. Like we've talked mm-hmm. about it before on this podcast where like you have something written somewhere and then it's copy and pasted everywhere. Yes. Right? Um, and this is basically that. So I did a little digging. Okay. And by a little digging, a lot of digging. Oh, uh... I found out where the article originally was written. And I found out the day that it was... I found that where this particular passage was written. Yes. And that was October 1st, 2007. Oh, good. And it was written by Wikipedia user Patrick1982. I did a cursory glance of him. Nothing seems wrong with him. I have no fucking idea where he got his sources because he didn't cite anything. He did a lot of work on the the Mokila Membe story, though. That's all I know. It doesn't even, but the other thing too is it doesn't have the HL Shanks bit in it either yet. Yeah. So that got added at a later date. So this originated as a snippet from a Wikipedia article, which then ended up on Gutenberg Free Press, which then ended up on the Daily Journalist. So this is a piece of story that has no originating source. And yeah. I don't know where it fucking came from. Clearly, there was people talking about them looking for brontosauruses. Yeah. Right? But, like, I don't know where the whole 
addition of them hearing the cry or having the crash be associated with it at all came yeah. from. Like, literally no clue. That is lost to history, as far as I, I can tell. And I'm not looking through 100,000 newspaper articles from 1920 because, you know, 1920 is a fucking mess. Mm -hmm. But, Brandon, before I end this episode... Yes. I want to talk about the, the Daily Journalist. All right. Spill the tea. Please don't visit the site, people. Just please don't. It's terrible. It's a bad website. It's bad. It's just terrible. It's not fact-checked in any way. And really, it's kind of like the 8chan of news reporting. But they if you wanted to visit it, we did provide a link at the bottom of this episode. <laughs> we did, but please don't. Please, please, for the don't love click of God, on don't, that. Don't, don't click, click on it. Don't click that link. Please don't click that link. And I'm going to quote what their view is towards journalism. Oh, shit. All right. The Daily Journalist exposes the truth without censorship or manipulative motives to justify a belief, interest, or faith. Journalism should be free for all without skew, not leading towards any tendency or creed that would harm the reputation of information. So it's very, um, it's very WikiLeaks-esque in description. Yeah. Um, but given the fact that they allow 9-11 truthers and alt-right folks to spread their missives on the site, uh, they're basically a less successful Fox News or Breitbart. In my yeah. Opinion. Um, the whole website feels like a scan. Uh, and to my knowledge, it runs no ads. I turned off my ad block to see. No fucking ads, Brandon. Huh. I have literally no fucking clue how it keeps the lights on. Like, Brandon, I don't know. I feel like there's something going on underneath the surface. Because yeah. then, because then I looked up. Uh, the person who runs the site. Oh, that's exactly what I was typing into Snapchat yes. trying to figure that out. Okay. So I looked up. So basically I went into their contact and like about us page because I was yeah. like, I need to fucking know who's responsible for this site. Cause like the article that I was using was under a section called the historian. Yeah. And then it was published by no one four years ago, March 17th, 2017 at one something AM which is indicating that it's probably a European uh, IP or address posting this thing. Um, whatever. Right? Yes. So the person who runs the site, its name is Jamie Enoch Ortega. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. Um, so... I did a little digging. Not a lot of digging, because at this point, I was like, my brain was like, mm -hmm. I need to stop. I need to get out of this fucking rabbit hole, right? And I found his LinkedIn. Okay. And... He says he has a degree from Ohio State University. I didn't check, because I didn't feel like checking in any way, shape, or form. His tagline on LinkedIn is president for the Daily Journalist's top three largest community of experts online. The Daily Journalist was established nine years ago by James Enoch Ortega. He has no other work listed on his, his, uh, uh, his LinkedIn. His about section reads like a bot wrote it. Um, welcome to the officially since Feb... 2014 world's largest community of top flight experts and growing every day larger. The Daily Journalist, the birthplace of neo-journalism, which neo-journalism is a concept that existed in the 1960s. He is not the that is not the birthplace of neo-journalism. Neo-journalism yeah. has a history, and if he was a fucking journalist, he'd know that history. <laughs> uh-huh. Think Thoughts, mind, knowledge, wisdom, research, comparing data, 360 view, time, hard analysis, expose, unbiased, exposure, neutrality. Um, then it has a bunch of other shit. Uh, and then he, there's some articles that he's written on LinkedIn. They're all from 2016. He hasn't written anything since as far as I can tell. Okay. Hillary Clinton is faker than online news. 
election will never be the same again. The hypocrisy of Hillary Clinton leads to civil war. Rants, outcomes, and Donald Trump predictions. <coughs> so he worked for a company called The Lantern, which is somewhere, uh, I don't know what that is. Um, it's the Ohio State University. Oh, I think newspaper? It's the Ohio State University. Yeah, it's the Ohio State University paper. He worked as an investigative journalist and something else, right? So um, he has a link. So he is, this person is, in fact, a real human being, right? Yeah. They have no articles on the Lantern. So uh, apparently the Lantern expunged them in yeah. some way, if they ever did. Um. Which I just realized, I think I'm viewing him with my actual LinkedIn profile, which makes me upset. <laughs> um, so, this dude is fucking insane, in my opinion. And the about info on his site claims, award winner, Ohio State. Yeah. I'm 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 also going around through his LinkedIn's and everything's Brandon so Brandon, much fun. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does Nothing. That mean? It, I have no idea. And now, Brandon, if you think that this has nothing to do with Makila Membe, you'd be fucking wrong. Because <laughs> Brandon, I found his fucking Quora profile. Oh my, John, we're doing the exact same reason. I literally just the whole time you're talking. Every time I I do something, you ah, uh, I just I found, opened his Quora. I found his fucking Quora. Profile. Also, that fucking profile picture. Do you see that profile picture? Yes, yes. And you know what? I'm sorry if this is punching down. This dude deserves to be punched down. In my yeah. opinion, he's a prick. I know for a fact that this dude's a prick because I read read how he writes and he talks to people. He's yeah. a douchebag. So, Brandon, he's a young earth creationist. Yeah. There's just going, reading through his profile and his, his um, creative things is, what should we believe? Charles Darwin or the Bible? Do monkeys believe in God? Uh, the, he's answering all these. And I know that this is him. Yeah. Because it says, worked at the lantern. Worked at the lantern, Brandon. There's now, one Brandon, about the giant of Kandahar. Oh God! Really? Yeah. I didn't see that one. Yeah. Which one is that? Uh, military personnel who are devoted in Afghanistan. How true is the giant of Kandahar? Oh God, that's a whole thing. Have we talked about? I think we talked about that on the uh, the one giant episode we did, right? A I think we bit. might have mentioned it. I don't think we went deep into it. I don't think we went deep into it. So, Brandon, I'm gonna leave, close this episode out. With a teaser for next week, basically. Um. So. Oh my God! I'm not talking. Oh, all right. So the sorry, the very last paragraph. I let me let me. Which one? Of the giant of Kandahar. Okay, read that. that, I didn't that, read that I'm one. just gonna read this. The that <laughs> sentence he does. The Smithsonian is responsible for the suppression of much information of much information regarding giant humanoids. So the Smithsonian is part of, uh, is trying to suppress information. Brandon, Brandon, I can't prove it, but I think this man was the man who posted that article. Oh, uh, I wouldn't. I can't prove uh. it, but I think he was because this is painting the Mokila Membe as potentially existing because it includes the Smithsonian Institute. And this just adds more evidence to my hypothesis <laughs> that I can't prove. Now, Brandon. Yes. I'm not going to talk about Mokila Membe anymore on the next episode. Really. Okay. Not about what he is because what Mokila Membe is, is a brontosaur at its core. That's what people believe it is. People believe it's a living dinosaur, Right. That's it. They think that it disproves evolution because if a living dinosaur existed, it disproves evolution. But as people have mentioned, uh, if the described version of Mokila Membe existed, it would in fact prove evolution because it doesn't look like 
the dinosaur that it's based off of at all. Yeah. So, a whole nother fucking thing. That's a whole nother mess of shit because people believe that pop media is reality. But Brandon. Yes. Mokile Membe is really only taken seriously now by young earth creationists. And as I mentioned, Jamie Enoch Ortega, which I just named him, but who fucking cares, is a young earth creationist. And I'm going to answer, I'm going to let you guys like rest on this. Think about it. Think about how it affects your life. What have you. And just get ready for the next episode of Mokila Membe, in which I talk about young earth creationists and why I fucking hate them. And I hate the way that they fucking use pseudoscience to say shit that's not true and then, like, also weirdly manipulatively use local people for their own aims and this, all that white, fucking white man's burden shit and all that absolute garbage. But, Brandon, this is what he says about Darwin theory. Okay. Which is... So this is some random person writing it, which that's also stupid in its own thing. Um, People who believe Darwin simply reject the notion of accountability in God. Since the European Enlightenment, the idea of God took many forms, which God baffled New Age thinkers. Christianity had to face that question. Evolution is the opium of the atheist. Yet it is not a law of nature, just a theory with many holes. One way to understand this theory comes in Yonaguni, Japan. The Japanese scientists say it's a man-made structure, but Western scientists say it's a natural formation. Evolution has swallowed other fields of science to subsist. Nonetheless, it is a theory on crisis. Brandon, he said on crisis instead of in crisis. (laughs) He supposedly has a degree in journalism. Yeah. And with that, the episode's done. I have nothing else to say. There's Carol. I just want to point out the time that, at the time, like when the the Darwin's theory of evolution was published, that it was, it wasn't an anti. Like it was, people viewed it as a way that were like enforced religious beliefs. Like it wasn't something that excluded religion. They were fa- found it as something that kind of goes hand in hand, like parallel to that belief. I, I also want to point out it has literally fucking nothing to do with the Age of Enlightenment whatsoever. Yeah. Because that's not the Age of Enlightenment. I wouldn't accuse him of being a rational man. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, as I promised, this was a fucking long episode. Yeah. Oh, sh- I just looked over at the timer. So, I'm gonna... I think it's time to close out the episode. Uh... This has been Cryptopedia. Uh, as always, you can find our website, CryptopediaCast.com, at CryptopediaCast for Twitter and Instagram. Email us, CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. Um, if you're mad at anything I said, take it up with me publicly on Twitter. Yeah. Be a man <laughs> or a woman. I was just going to give it your Twitter profile as a joke, but okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Fucking bring it. I'll fucking... I'll do whatever. I I will. I have no problems arguing on this one whatsoever. Because you know what? Doesn't hurt my fucking career. I'm a fucking scientist, bitches. <laughs> so fucking bring it. I'll go to I'll go to bat for science on this one. Um, we have a Patreon and uh want to thank the wonderful people who allow us to do this nonsense. Uh, Brandon, can you uh, can you give <laughs> yes. him a, a thanks for the jackalopes? Yes, we will thank Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and fuck Andrew Jackson. There we go. Uh, we have a Facebook group as well. Um, I haven't done anything with it in a while. I think I think. Uh, uh, Lenwood, Lenwood just posted some uh, just an posted oracles in there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's always good. Um, if you enjoy the podcast and your plat- your chosen platform allows you to rate, review, or subscribe, please do so. Um, share it with people who you think will enjoy it. Um, maybe not this episode. Maybe this is not a good starter episode for someone. 
<laughs> we got the Mothman episode. That one's pretty good. The Mothman one was pretty good. Mothman was pretty good. It was pretty. It's a pretty good entry point to the podcast. Yeah. I think we've got Man uh, Bat. We've got Man Bat's pretty good. Bat Squatch. We did bat a lot Squatch. of bat related creatures in a row. Yep, that was a weird one. Um, but yeah, if you have any monster requests or stories that aren't Wendigo or Jersey Devil, please send them in. Um, Wendigo will only happen if I can find somebody who is a part of that cultural tradition to talk about because of problematic issues involving white people in the Wendigo um, <laughs> that I discovered in my, my research because the Wendigo is effectively white people. So have fun with that, I thought. <laughs> um, or at least it's become effectively white people. Uh, so yeah, uh, and the Jersey Devil is a work in progress. So yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brendan at cryptopcast.com. And if you have any issues with anything I've said and you like to fight with me, you could find me on Twitter at JF Dunham. It's actually at Crypto Brandon, but I mean, fine. Fight with me about Brandon stuff too. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm in a fighting mood right now. This, this, this episode's got me, got me hopping. It's got you. It's got me something. It's got your. You know what's funny? <laughs> yeah. So originally this episode was supposed to be the jackalope. Oh, was it? I found all the sources I needed for the jackalope, and like I was ready to write the jackalope episode, and then I clicked on the the folder where I keep all the episodes that are in progress, and I saw Mokila Membe, and I'm like, I want to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> um. So if you wanna if you wanna follow me, I'm on Instagram at mu twenty twenty fifty seven. I'm on Twitter at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com. My email is john at cryptopediacast.com. And I also have a toy review show called Toy Office. Um I might be posting more content to that soon because I'm gonna have more free time. Yeah, I know uh, you've we'll been getting see. more toys. Yeah, I I have a real serious problem and my house is filled with toys. I have I have all of the Burger King uh the McDonald's Beast Wars toys now. Oh nice. Um, I got I finally got under three, which is literally just a uh a shell that transforms and by splitting it open splitting a lion's head open and there's just a robot there. Okay. Um it was made for children under three years old. It's kinda got like a vaguely Optimus Prime head. Hmm. I don't know. It's really weird and I I adore it. So there's that. Nice. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. I wonder if he feels comfortable with us um, calling him out on an episode with this level of manic energy. Maybe? I don't think he has any issue. Plus, if you want some art done, go look up Tom. He does uh, the good stuff. That's true. That's true. He's done a lot of stuff for a lot of like podcasts that I respect a lot. And like yeah. a lot of comedy networks, I respect. Yeah. So like, fucking awesome on him. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of really... weird. Like, to if I'm watching a podcast and then on the bottom, like on YouTube, it'll, they'll show like their shirts and hats and stuff, and I'm like, oh, that's Tom's stuff. Yeah, it's pretty fucking great. Yeah. I adore it. It's pretty yeah. awesome. Um, good on you, Tom. Yeah. Good on you. Congratulations. Um. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. Things are so fucking far past weird at this point, I don't even know what to say. Hmm.